from Celebrate Mexico Now for hosting this event, um, and you guys for joining us on this beautiful day. This has been in the works for quite some time now, and we're really excited to share it with you. Um, I'm Groana, and this is Marta. Uh, we're both photographers, multidisciplinary artists, um, and we began working together because we wanted to have candid and honest conversations with the art world and share that to the larger with the art larger audience. Um, what am I doing? Um, and it all started because we wanted to show the diverse experience and voices in the Latin American community. Um, and as Libby said, we're taking over the Baxter Street blog, so please be sure to check that out. We have currently three up at the moment, so you got some reading to catch up on. <laughs> uh, us. So the way this is going to go, it's seven minute lightning talks. Um, we're going to go one after the other really quickly. There won't be a Q&A, but you are invited to stick around afterwards and continue the conversation. And we're going to have a little after get together at Pulqueria, um, a few blocks away. And we'll put the address up for you guys. And Marta will explain a bit more. Hi. Um, so yeah, this, this event is very dear to my, close to my heart because I'm Mexican and I love showcasing my fellow artists. People. I don't know, and because um, this is also a very interesting time to be Mexican in the States, so we wanted to explore more um, about that, but when we started doing it, we found out that um, finding Mexican artists who live in New York, it's not easy, like it was very difficult to find a lot of them, it took a lot of research, and not because there aren't, but because there is no, not a community or a, a place to really look for it. So that's why instead of show only showcasing a few artists, we decided to showcase a lot of them. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. Um, so without any more to say, um, let's give a hand for Alas Campos. So I think we'll turn off, Daniel, can you turn off the light? We'll just turn it off so we can see the... Is that good? Yeah. Does that look okay? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, it's very quick, the introduction. Um, so, yeah, I graduated from ICP 2012, and I have been working freelance now between photo and films. I have been doing motion now. But uh, personal work, I love street photography and portraiture. And, um, and yeah, I think I, what I like the most is just uh, document or accumulate uh, or collect um, the things I see in my life and just small presentation of my personal work in street photography. I'm going too fast, let me know. Yeah. I don't know if anyone or I don't know if the next person I don't know what's happening. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Maybe you can just read everyone's bio in case people don't have to. Um, sure. At the beginning, or maybe read his now. Oh, that's yeah. Now. Have, do you have one? Anyone want to shoot? I have one. <laughs> <laughs> so. Or I don't know if anyone has any question. Like I can do it very quickly. No. I have a question. Is there a reason why, you did, like, you didn't focus on like people's faces in a lot of those portraits? Um, or a lot of those yeah. Things? I mean, I think what I like most, for example, when I'm in the street, you see a lot of times just. <coughs> The hair before the face, and actually, like, I do like that a lot. Like uh, the fact that you don't see Gucci, right. and also like what I like the most is when you start collecting the collecting the photographs. I think you start saying something very nicely or interesting. I don't know in the back of your mind of why you are taking the photograph. Right. So, um, and I like hair, so. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. So Ada Campos is an in the independent portrait photographer based in New York City. Graduated from the General Studies full-time program at the International Center, Center of Photography. He started working as a set photographer in the movie Año Bicesto. Año Bicesto. 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 Sorry. Winner of the Odo. It's okay. I can read it if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> you know your pronunciation. Yeah. I mean, my background I was before coming here. I was a set photographer on films, and uh, and yeah, and I now work with a a, a a team who does interactive documentaries. The team work or the company is the Skin Deep, and they do like um, the main concept of the company is how do we connect in today's technology, you know, as a human, and uh, and now I work film in space with them. And I work in films also, like doing like a lot of things in between the assistant camera or set photography or lighting and then in my free time I do my personal work. So yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> my view is a little bit old so I haven't updated so that's, I think it's better I talk. Well thank you guys. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Carla Carvallar. Carla Carvallar was born in Mexico City. Her work in video, photography, and installation has been exhibited in the US, Mexico, Asia, and Europe, including Exteresa Arte Actual Museum in Mexico City, Today Art Museum in Beijing, the Stad Schoenborg <laughs> Theater in Utrecht, New Zealand. Um, Jamaica Center of the Arts in New York City, and Du Quang Gallery in Seoul. She was artist in residency in the Watermill Center of Octo in October 2014 with the arts collective Lydia Junction. Carla Carvallar holds a Master of Arts from the New York City University and a Bachelor in Graphic Design and Photography from Universidad Interconectada Intercontinental in Mexico City. She currently lives and works in New York. Um, <coughs> hi. Uh, so, uh, thank you for organizing this pretty thing. And uh, to the Festival of Mexico now. Um, I, I have a friend that has a very bad vision. He's uh, actually considered blind legally. And, but she grew up not knowing this. She thought she could see her mother. Never told her uh, she wanted her to not to grow like a feeling she has. A, she had a um, handicap. So she eventually uh, realized about her vision was, but not before she took uh, driving lessons. Um, yeah, it didn't go really pretty well. Um, so. She she didn't know what what you know she had a sort of struggle but she never she couldn't real know what was um, this story sounds a little weird because it's something that seems too also obvious but um, actually it's very difficult to to really know where your reactions are coming from where your real motivations um, are um, for your actions 
so th this is a place where my where my work um, wants to explore and where it when it where it resides. So um, I work mostly in video. I do performance for the camera. I perform uh, repetitive actions that um, are um, stand-ins for our psychological threats, our, the different layers of our personality, and how our cultural background influences also um, our, our reactions and our, our beings. Um, so, uh, Jung said that knowing the darkness in ourselves is the best way to um, to relate to the darkness in other people, and I think this is true not only as individuals but also as societies. Um, I my work is very open-ended, so the audience can um, have a reaction, um, their own interpretation that it's gonna depend upon their uh, cultural background as well and their. Um, psychological states. So I'm going to show three videos. Um, the first one is... Um, the first one is a uh, one minute video. Well, a single channel with sound. It's um, a constant loop. It doesn't doesn't have any cuts or any interruption. It's um, meant to be projected on. Um, it's not. It's really not for for screening. So I'm just gonna show a, a little a little excerpt. Then the, the last video I'm gonna show. I'm, just, I'm gonna show a little bit of. It's an eight-minute video, and I'm gonna show a little of the beginning, and then skip to to 
uh, later point. Thank you. Our next presenter is Paul Barcena. Paul Barcena is a fine art photographer born in 1986 in Torreón, Coahuila. Paul was raised in Querétaro where he worked as an accountant for five years. Over time, he put more and more energy into his photography, eventually enrol enrolling at La Escuela Activa de, la de Fotografía. In 2015, he relocated to New York to study at International Center of Photography, General Studies Program. Paul was awarded ICP Rita K. Hillman Award for Excellence in July 2016 for his work, including the series Institutionalized in which he explores the murky divide between the institutionalized art, art world and naturally creative world outside. His work plays with scale, color, light, and lines. In a combination of abstract and candid shots, Paul's images challenge how we interpret what's inside the frame. Hello, everybody. 
Thanks for being here now on Sunday. Um, well, before showing um, the project that I want to show you, I want to show you two very quickly two projects before, just to put a little bit more of context into the work. Um, so, this first work, uh, entirely loft. And it's a project a lot about uh, perception in photography. There's a lot of repetition layers in the work. And it's also about personal experience and, and work and work and growth as, a, as an artist. Um, This other project that I have also been working here in New York, uh, it's Intimacy Creative. Um, this project, uh, I took some inspiration, what's going on in social media and how everybody creates its own profile and everything is happening in its own life before putting out there for everybody else. Uh, part of my archivals are very intimate photos. I have never been really uh, personally prepared to put out them. So using this and really using a lot of crops and filtering them and creating them, putting, uh, preparing them to show them in a way. Um, to the third project that I, the one that I really want to show today and that I want to talk about and discuss. Um, and it's institutionalized. So as a background, even though it's already mentioned, I moved here to New York about one and a half years ago. I come from a medium, medium sized city town in Mexico. Uh, so there was like an adjustment to being here, uh, like a cultural shock. Um, also, I was working in a different field, so there was this process of like um, entering to more of a creative field and trying to see like how everything worked. Also, I started try going a lot to museums, um, looking for inspiration, seeing, searching for different artists, seeing their work. And being there, I started also like looking at the spaces themselves. Um, I was very interested in how everything worked. I have always been interested in how things operate, work, function. So it was part of like an exploration of itself. And then on the other side, being new to the city, I had always my camera, always looking for something that caught my attention, uh, looking for details everywhere, in the subway, in the streets. Um, everywhere around, around the city, basically. And I initially was starting developing these two bodies of work, like kind of separately. Um, I was even printing them in different sizes and scales, because <coughs> I thought it was right at the moment. Um, but starting to see them together, it got to a point in which I was starting and comparing many different things. And those different things um, were like, where I come from, where I'm going to, who I am, where I fit in, uh, the outside world, the art world, how everything kind of intersects <coughs> with each other. Um, so, I'm gonna start showing some photos because that's what we're here for. Um, it doesn't look that good in the projector, I think it's like really overblown, but a lot of these photos, the backgrounds, well, all of the photos, the backgrounds were taken at major art museums in New York, kind of representing that institutionalized part of it. Um, I was taking photos in the Guggenheim, MoMA, the Wiggly, 
and then overlaying them, I was uh, putting like snapshots of stuff, uh, of things that were capture, capturing my attention, and then putting them together, like seeing how they would interact with each other. There was like intersections, there were things that were like went to the other way, opposites. So kind of studying this, seeing how everything kind of meshed together, but at the same time they were different. And getting to know more about this art scene, the dynamics and structure of it, um, I came to realize that it's kind of like a game. It's a game, you already know the players, you already know the teams, you know where they are going to be playing, what they, and it's difficult to crack in, it's difficult to fit in, and especially coming from uh, a Latin American country, I think nowadays it's a, it's a, it's a very, mm, let me rephrase that. Um, nowadays, if you look at the people that are being exhibited, more and more there's people from minorities, people from other countries, but the, we are still like bench players per se. It's not like a like thing that's like outside in the door that it's said, but it is. Like <laughs> the work that comes from all of our uh, countries that are not like the Western art seem like as uh, exotic in a way many times, not featured. Um, so it was part of what I was trying to study. Like how everything meshes in. Also how do I or you <coughs> machine in this in this world, in this city, in this culture. So oh god. <laughs> um, well you don't really see the other one. That was um but part of um, the, the major project that I worked on last year. It was an exploration. Um, it was kind of like a study. And I think that that's one of the positives when you're working as an artist, is that you have this opportunity to explore the ideas and themes that sometimes <coughs> they cannot be explored in the formal or normal way to approach things. You can, it's, uh, it creates like this opportunity to put like a different viewpoint on it. And I think that right now, as Latinos, as people from other countries, as Mexican, we have this not only <coughs> opportunity, but also responsibility to put out there work that doesn't have to talk specifically of Mexico or Latin America or whatever, but it, it creates an opportunity to talk in a positive light about who we are as humans, what we can bring to the table. And I think that's it. Thanks for our next. Our next presenter is Ima Borges Geisler. Um, Irma is a photographer, educator, biologist, and a cultural leader for Mexican Americans on Staten Island. Irma immigrated to New York in 1991 from Mexico City. Irma's photographs are part of her ongoing social documentary series, Simple Moments of an Emerging Presence, of Mexican Americans in New York. Currently is exhibiting at Alice Austin House Museum and exhibited at Museum of the City of New York, Governor's Island Art Fair, Hodges Gallery, Umbrella, Umbrella Gallery, Newhouse Center of Contemporary Art, Snow Harbor Cultural Center. She was featured on the New York Times Lens Blog, um, Mexicans in New York Traditions and Turning Points, finalist in the, in the International Fifth Julia Margaret, Julia Margaret Cameron Award in 2011 and NIFA Mentoring Program for Immigrant Artists. In 2011, City Councilwoman Debbie Rose conferred on Irma the Staten Island Woman Who Preserve History. She is, founder of, <coughs> she is founder 
artistic and program director of the annual Dia de Muertos in Staten Island, established in 1992. <coughs> in 2016, commemorates the 24th anniversary of this festival. She holds a PhD in econo ecological entomology from Oxford University and a bachelor in science degree in biology from Autonomous University of Mexico City, UNAM. Do you want me to check them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Hi, um, so I was introduced already. I want to thank uh, the Camera Club and uh, Martha and Rada for organizing this uh, event and also Mexico Now, Claudia Norman, that She's she will come She's soon. A little late. And uh, so I just want to talk briefly about um, what. Uh, um, this project, uh, which is uh, photographing the Mexican community in Staten Island, I live in Staten Island. I didn't start it uh, as a photographer. I took a course in that room in 1999, and then um, I have been printing silver gelatin prints since then. And uh, eventually, and I was taking last landscapes uh, at the time when I just started my surroundings. And then in 2001, I started focusing more in the Mexican community. So um, as documentary work, I, and I didn't have any really uh, training on it, I started taking pictures. And so the range of pho photographs is very varied, it's very diverse. So um, I, the, we took these pictures uh, that which are from the New York Times, and just, uh, this, these are the photos that were published in the New York Times. Um, so the first uh, one, the first picture uh, is uh, um, during the Easter time, uh, there is a whole procession of the Mexican community where they organize and they actually symbolically they uh, make uh, Jesus, this person, David Sosa, to carry the cross. Uh, uh, around the island, and uh, then eventually they will nail him into the, symbolically nail him into the cross, and then they will hide him on the church, standing there for hours. <laughs> so this is very striking. Uh, this, is, this is just one of those occasions, and then uh, uh, I have been taking photographs uh, in people's houses, and this is uh, just kids playing around in, in the backyard. Uh, <laughs> You see the boys with the cellular phones and the girls are running around. And um, the next uh, photograph uh, is uh, this uh, person who is uh, Rosa. Uh, she's pregnant and I uh, ask her if I can come in and take a pictures of her. It's not easy to do documentary work. Uh, I, I don't find it so easy uh, because uh, you have to deal with people. You have to take, uh, I don't want to take pictures when they're posing. And so it's, a, it's a, I don't find it so easy. And uh, I want to take pictures like more natural, uh, like if I wasn't there. <laughs> but it's difficult, but uh, fortunately, I'm very grateful also about all the Mexican people uh, that had allowed me to come into their lives and photograph them. <laughs> uh, the next uh, photograph uh, shows uh, the environment of Staten Island, but also we have a mariachi band, we have a quinceañera uh, that is coming from a limousine. And uh, so this is actually the, the, what is happening uh, in the contemporary work of the Mexican community now. Um, the next one is um, uh, Cipriana and her daughter Rita Contreras. Uh, this lady, uh, Cipriana, who um, at the time she was 82 years old, she comes from Mexico to visit her, her family that are here because they cannot really go to Mexico because they're undocumented. So uh, she comes back and forth between Mexico and New York and she has also family in North Carolina. So she goes, stays some <coughs> time here and then goes to North Carolina and then she goes back to, to uh, Mexico City, to uh, Michoacán. Okay, the next one uh, shows uh, this photograph I took uh, once uh, in Christmas Eve. 
Um, I was going to prepare dinner for Christmas and I went to a Mexican store and there were I spotted four ladies there buying everything to make tamales and I asked them, oh, are you going to make tamales? And uh, they said, yeah. And uh, I didn't know them and I asked them, well, can I come and photograph you make tamales? <laughs> and that was Christmas Eve. And uh, so I thought I was expecting my family and I was cooking and I went to buy this stuff for make ponche, a uh, hot drink. And so I thought, my God, I shouldn't lose this opportunity. So I, uh, I went back home. They said yes. I didn't know them. They said yes. So I went back home and they grabbed my camera and I went to the place. So I came here and she already, they had made buñuelos, which is, uh, they, they made it the night before, so they were just there. And uh, so that's how I, I took uh, this uh, photograph. But, uh, I mean, it's, you, when you're doing documentary work, you have to do it like that. Either you take it or, or the opportunity or not. And I thought, oh my God, I just should do it. <laughs> but I was very nervous about not having dinner ready for the evening. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next one, this is, uh, I'm interested in uh, showing the, also um, how young people, teenagers, uh, trying to feed also with uh, the, 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 the um, the environment where they are. She's young, but they also she has tattoos and has her, uh, dressed herself as a, any other teenager. Doesn't necessarily has to be Mexican. Okay. The next uh, one. The gentleman one this time. Okay. The next one. Uh, this is a. Uh, it was in a wedding, um, and uh, I just uh, saw this little girl, and I just ran quick to take the picture, and I went back to wherever I was. Uh, and this is the picture I got. I, I, this is one of my favorite uh, photographs. Uh, this uh, other one is uh, um, about uh, a boy that is dressing up for uh, for his baptize. Uh, a lot of Mexican families uh, they come here and they wait until they can have a, a service in Spanish. And this is the case with this boy. So they they did it later on. Um, the next one uh, is. Uh, just a regular communion in a church. And um, the next one is a part of Palm Sunday. And so these are the wedding um, <coughs> women of Jerusalem. And the next one, uh, these uh, guys, uh, also I was driving by and I saw these guys uh, waiting to go into the church for a wedding. And I just came down and I started taking pictures of them. And uh, so they were wondering who I was and I was there. That's it. <laughs> okay. Eric St. James Lopez is a multimedia poet whose work on genre, gender, and queer representations. <coughs> They're currently in art auctions and events assistant at Belladonna, Belladonna Press, as well as the publicity assistant at <laughs> it's it's a made-up word, Glitterati Incorporated. Oh, Glitterati Incorporated. <laughs> Photographs from her, their series, Tipping Point, are currently displayed in Plutocracy Bureaucracy, a poetic collaboration between Sarah Apple, Apple? Appel. Appel and Claire Bedoya under Book Press, of which they are also a member. They're currently working on their new book of poetry, Sister Act, mm -hmm. in collaboration <coughs> with Devante Hart. Thank you. Um, so, I'm about to show you some photos that I took during my senior thesis show. Uh, the series is called Tipping Point. Uh, and though. Oh, it's going out. Um, I'll start here. Uh, so, I made these about. I guess I was starting my junior year. Uh, so, about a year, more than a year ago. And it was during a time period where I was uh, coming, finally coming to terms with being like a non-binary trans person. Uh, so a lot of them uh, are me kind of, I felt like going into a studio kind of hiding and like trying to discover myself. I didn't want to go out and like take uh, documentary work or anything that was involving too many people. Uh, so I'm going to read from my artist statement because it's been a while. <laughs> um, 
These photographs lie in the recesses of the queer gaze, delve into the intersections, and attempts to exaggerate and conflate the limitations of identity categorizations. The still lives are rendered with sharp digital clarity, with an asphyxiated purpose attached to each corner and crevice of the observed subjects. The tight control over the artwork functions as a role reversal of the queer subjects lacking control of their own image. This conditional relationship to each still life results in photographs imbued with obsessive anxiety, still objects and figures captured in kilter transition. The erotic qualities of the photographs are not felt in a rosy retrospection, but rather in the decay of post-traumatic relief. The subjects of the still lives, devices of globalized capital exchange, have lost their initial intended purpose. The objects as such are deviant subjects of sexual drive and lustful obsession. Nearly all bodies represented in a series come from the same 99 cent store, and still keen carefulness and celebration of these bodies are practiced. In these photographs, all bodies are treated as opulent as all bodies are opulent, participate in the industry of opulence, and are maximalist in their histories and in their infinite varied expressions. The sharp clarity of the images are the sharp clarity of the images exaggerate this normative investigative gaze. Um, so there's more, but um, essentially, I was in the studio and. Um, these photographs actually were meant, or about like 40 inches uh, tall by however much wide, um, and they are all extremely sharp. So what I did was I took it. Many of these photographs are like, like 100 photographs in one, and I just was very obsessively trying to make everything as sharp as possible, <coughs> and I had complete control over the images that I was making, or like it felt. There's not, there's no way you can completely have complete control of any photo that you make, but to me it felt both uh, very comforting, but also made me very uncomfortable at the same time to have all this power. Um, and during this time period it felt like I was uh, powerless in a lot of ways, so this was a way of me taking control of that uh, power. Uh, and I you know also just being, a, a, just being a trans or non-binary queer person in this sort of space was it was very difficult because I did. I felt like I had to be a sort of teacher to my teacher even, mm -hmm. and the people in my classroom, uh, and that was very difficult, and I felt felt very lonely. Um, and so this is a kind of time period where I was, um, where I was dealing with a lot of emotions, and I think you can kind of tell. <laughs> I came into the studio with like a baseball bat, literally like hit the TV, <laughs> um, and that, I mean I didn't buy the TV. I just found it on the street. I was like, okay, this is perfect. Um, and they all kind of feel as if they're from the same uh, haunted house or some sort of like uh, location. And a lot of the photographs are uh, feels as if they come from a space of this might be a real place, maybe it's not. Um, and just a lot of trying to questioning myself of uh, so, uh, where I was at in my in my own life. Um, a lot of it has to do with beauty and desire. Um, and they come into play the intricate details of the subject surface. Um, and there's some sort of like suspension of disbelief uh, that sort of occurs. Uh, despite the obsessive care utilizing the creation of the uh, bodies depicted, they're not, nonetheless, diasporic, misplaced, and ultimately lie frozen in their lack of autonomy. Uh, and I felt like with uh, photography in general, there is or like a photographic any um, object or like especially a person, there is a lack of autonomy that occurs. Um, and so a lot of what I was trying to get at was that the visibility through an attempt at the opulence that I'm showing, uh, however cheap it might look uh, at the same time, is a form of non-consensual and artistic labor um, to make the experiences <coughs> of the viewer more coherent. Um, and I felt that femininity in its unrestrained form is uh, self-care, carefulness, self-celebration, and is maximalist. And the maximalist approach to representation, representation related to my interest in bodies that are seen as excessive or overtly complex um, and showy associations that are often used to describe non-performing queer bodies. Um, so a lot of these kind of felt like I was taking photographs of myself. So this, these stills that I was making felt like I was photographing myself instead of wanting to photograph me. Because mm -hmm. I felt like there was this pressure um, to take photographs of myself by my fellow roommate, um, classmates, and I was feeling like, very self-conscious. I don't like taking photos of myself. So instead I went to photograph these photos um, 
and it felt like a lot of queer photography. It has a lot to do with like dressing up and like putting on a dress and like makeup, whatever, and like uh, doing drag. And I didn't want to. I didn't feel like doing that. Um, and I didn't feel like showing myself, so <coughs> I didn't do these objects instead uh, with the money that I could afford. Um, so I try to do this thing where um, I was getting everything from a 99 cent store. So the, I'm kind of like trying to make everything look as like high production as possible, but there's like a you can't to a certain degree do that uh, with a 99 cent store material. But I think you can tell from like how gross some of it looks and how like decadent at the same time was the kind of like thing I was going for. Those like fake pearls and like that fake gold. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, not sure what else to say. This was a lot of photographs in one. Um, a lot of time, maybe like I don't know how I don't I can't tell how many hours it took. Like it was mostly Photoshop work. Um, but yeah, thank you. Could hear the stories of, of Mexican immigrants. So um, that was when I met Pedro Cruz. That you will see his photo in a while. Um, I was walking with my camera through Sunset Park, that was the neighborhood that I lived in when I came to New York, and I saw this place called Rosalindo Grocery Store with Mexican products, and I'm sure most of you who are Mexican and miss home, when you see a place with Mexican products, it's, it's like <laughs> super um, exciting. So I took a photograph of the place and I kept walking and then a man with a blue apron came out and started shouting to me in English, please take a photo of me. And so I turned around and I saw him and he was the owner of the place. So I, I spoke in Spanish. I told him, yeah, sure, hola. I can, te tomo tu foto. And he was surprised. He was like, why are you blonde girl talking to me in Spanish? And, and yeah, that was part of, that united us in a way. So I came into the store and we spoke for about two hours about San Juan de los Lagos, that's where my family is from and the reason why I'm blonde. Um, we talked about Puebla, his hometown, Mexican food, um, fear, uh, the willingness of making a better life and well, also the true meaning of missing home. Uh, so that day I, I went to my to my place and I wrote the idea for the project. Um, I decided I wanted to keep looking for more Pedros and trying to tell their stories and show like the super different profiles that exist of Mexican immigrants living in the US. So what I did first was through so social media I looked for more Pedros and I found about two that way but I also walked through the uh, largest uh, Mexican neighborhoods in New York uh, the Barrio, South Bronx, uh, Sunset Park, Bushwick, Queens, etc. And I came to the stores uh, asking everyone, like, do you know any Pedros? <laughs> yes, they did. Uh, so, yeah, now I'm going to show you the photographs. The, these are the stories of the Pedros of New York, Mexican immigrants looking for a better life. This is Pedro Cruz the first Pedro I met, with his blue apron. He has, two son, uh, he, he has a son who is a policeman now, and a daughter that's a social worker. And he's a beautiful man. Mm -hmm. Pedro Ramirez. He works in a, as a bartender in a place called Casa Mezcal. Um, he's also a... Uh, he, he's a trainer, he wants to be a bo boxing trainer, and uh, he's been living in New York since 2011. He had to go back because his mother has diabetes and she was really sick, so he came back but then he, he came to New York again in 2013. This is Pedro Senad. He's an architect, uh, he just finished his master's in Columbia University. Pedro Guillermo Curiel, he has been working in this deli that's in, uh, in the Lower East for 11 years. He takes the sandwich orders 
but his favorite thing to do in New York is uh, play soccer in Flushing. Pedro Rodrigo Gonzalez, he's a ballet dancer. Oh, oh baby. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he's also a fashion blogger, as you can see, he's super fashion. Uh, <laughs> and his favorite Disney princess is Snow White, which I think it's like a beautiful uh, thing to say. Pedro Reyes, I, I, I also thought that it was important to tell the stories of other Pedros that are not necessarily in the US now, but that have this dream of coming here and making a better life. So this Pedro, he lives in Mexico City, his sister lives in Philadelphia and his dream is to come and see her again. They haven't seen each other for four years. Pedro Ruiz, he works in El Barrio, in East Harlem, and he has been living uh, in New York since 2003. He hasn't been back to Mexico ever since. Um, so, yeah, people who have seen the stories of Pedros, uh, whether being Mexican or not, I think, uh, have been able to see like a different uh, sites of immigration. Um, I think that media tend to cover immigration like in a super political way, and it's it's. Uh, it's a concept that goes much deeper than that. Uh, it's superhuman. It's something that, um, yeah, it shouldn't be used as a political weapon. So, uh, I don't know. I think the stories of the Pedros could be the stories of Yangs, of Mohammed, of Pietros. Uh, it could be the story of any of us. And I think that's what's really m moving about the project and the stories about these uh, amazing men. Um, I learned from this project that immigration is made up by individuals. It's not homogeneous, it's not a homogeneous uh, problem and each, each single person has to have the right to tell their own stories, each, each specific case of immigration. Um, so, yeah, also migration is a natural process. Uh, uh, animals migrate to look for a, a better place to live. Um, and we humans also do so. I mean, the, re the reasons may be different, but at the end, we're, we're trying to look for a better life. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I am, I, I am really passionate about photography, and, and I think it's a super powerful medium to, to move people, to express ideas, to show stories, and also to make us more human. And so <coughs> the, the Pedras project uh, helps in some way. <laughs> Um, the next presenter is Benji Bustamante. Benji Bustamante is a 20-year-old Mexican-American photographer from Los Angeles, California, currently based in Brooklyn, New York. His work explores our relationship with his Mexican heritage, religiously and culturally, by documenting patterns and references that have become familiar to him. Hi guys, um, uh, Benji. Uh, I moved to New York a year ago. Uh, after living in this uh, same house for 18 years, I decided to get out um, just because family is stressful and I needed to find myself. So um, I moved here, I had no friends, uh, so I knew I needed to be productive and make the most of my time. Uh, so I laid out this, this series work that I had been working on, but I didn't quite know that it was, it was there. So I, I just looked at all the work I had and started laying it out and editing and editing. Um, a little bit about myself, I come from a big family, five brothers and a sister. Um, when I was 11 years old, my mom passed away. Um, uh, I, I was raised Catholic, um, but now it's, it's, uh, it's kind of died down. I used to go to church every Sunday. Uh, now it's more of sim like symbolic. Uh, um, sorry. Uh, uh, it's, it's it's more. Uh, it reminds me of my family, and it, it's 
something I want to keep, keep uh, close to me. Um, so, this work is, um, sorry guys. This work is about my, my house, my dad mostly, um, and about my home falling apart basically after a losing parent and um, the effects they had on my house and just my family. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, a lot, of, a lot of things in my house are just kind of like all over the place scattered. Like there's a, there's a car seat there used as a couch. My dad and my grandpa are just hanging out there with all this kind of um, commotion, messiness around. Um, but I, I try to find a, a beauty in it and um, yeah. Um, my dad's a carpenter. Uh, he lost two of his fingers because of it, mm. as you can see there. Mm. Um, yeah. This is my aunt, my dad, and my grandpa. Again, in front of the house, just hanging out. Um, a lot of the, my, this work uh, shows a lot of Catholic symbolism and uh, yeah, like uh, this. The frame right here was carved by my grandpa, actually, for my father, um, for the very frame. Um, and again, here there's kind of this chaos um, in the house. There's Christmas lights that have been up for who knows how long just because no one's really taking care of the house. My, my dad doesn't really you know, keep up with it. Um, it was always my mom who was in charge and took care of everything. Um, but yeah. That's another one in my dad's hand. Uh, my street in LA is lined with these palm trees. Um, again, just something that reminds me of home. Uh, yeah. This is my kitchen. Um, so I haven't been home since last Christmas, but I hear that the house is coming, coming back from being this craziness. Um, the house is painted now. I haven't seen it, um, but. Again, I'm um, trying to find beauty in, in the house that I was raised in, and yeah. This broken mirror reflecting the palm trees in front of my house. Some family portraits. And again, some more religious uh, stuff, like the Bible in my dad's workshop, and his old trophies, uh, just like in this chaos uh, in my house. Before I left, uh, we got this couch that didn't really fit in with the house. Um, I, I just wanted to take a portrait on it, a uh, self-portrait on it, um, just because it was it's kind of bizarre in this craziness. Um, yeah. Some more craziness in my backyard and the couches again, <coughs> kind of not fitting in in the messy house. Um, one more of the kitchen and um, these guitars in my living room with the old couch. <laughs> cool. Thanks, guys. <laughs>
time of this presentation about my background because uh, I think the photography comes uh, to me uh, in the work field that I used to do in several indigenous communities in Mexico, working in the La Huasteca in the same region of Mexico. Uh, uh, I was working with indigenous communities, Nahua, Sotomi, and Tepewas. I don't know how to. Okay. Um, how can I do that? Yeah, thank you so much. And I was like document as the way that we do in the uh, photojournalism documentary style, uh, but taking photos like using uh, photos as a tool, as an anthropological tool, uh, working with indigenous uh, with uh, shamanists like this is an altar. I used to uh, writing and doing photo videos, interviews, recording, and like uh, different kind of rituals, mostly with shamans. Uh, the process of the Textiles and also working with rural families who have uh, uh, relatives uh, in US. Um, this is one of the healers that I document in La Huasteca. He speaks Tenec. And in 2011, I moved to New York for all of this immigration, this huge immigration from these communities who live in basically in Queens and the South of the Bronx. And I spent six months living with them and their houses, and I tried to document most as anthropologist that a documentary photographer. No, I think that as a professional, I start like like maybe one year ago when I uh, was studying ICP, and I realized like my skills were growing up. <coughs> and I live with them. They live in Flushing, and they work with uh, Korean people. They speak Otomi, but also Korean. And yeah, and I was like trying to describe and do ethnographic work, and also I get a job in La Jornada, uh, working like reporting in NACLA also. And yeah, I speak about the how is this immigration of the population of the indigenous community living in US, concrete in, in, in New York. And I spend time with them, going to their uh, homes, to their jobs and uh, see the festivities like Carnival, like all the saints of Day of the Dead. And when I was in ICP, I just started like, working with the same people. I think that my work is super organic because I basically work with people that I know since I came here. I also used to work as a community organizer. And it's like, like the project that I did in, in ICP was about the abuelas, an um, environmental portrait of documented Mexican grandmothers. And, in, the, in this first like um, uh, work, I took a portrait. I am still working in this project through the Magnum Foundation Fellowship that I get on July. And I basically asked them, like, how do you like to be represented in these photos? Imagine that these photos are going to show in, in a big rally on a newspaper. No? And I gave, the, I gave them the opportunity to they, like, choose their own outfit and combine with their own decoration that they have in their walls, no? the memory, the symbolism of the religion. And yeah, they basically choose their own outfit. And now the second part of this project, like I am still working in the environmental program, but I choose four women, four abuelas of this project, and I am following them in their daily life. No? The struggles, the, how, where they were, what kind of work they do, like this one, like Gisela, she's a healer also, and, but she works in La Maquila. And, and the next one is Guadalupe, she, she gets dialysis each three days a week, and she's also a singer, a performer, and an actress. And, and the next one is Juanita. Uh, She's a seller, and, and Doña Irma, she picked garbage in the street and selling you know, and with the Chinese community. And they also I am asking to them to give me the opportunity to see their albums, and because also I have a, a, a historian background, and I used to work with a lot of archival materials, and I am fascinated with the, the, the whole uh, photographies that the people from our community have taken for the last 20, 30 years. No? And, and they gave me the, some photos that they took when they uh, came um, to New York, or photos that they bring, brought to New York. You know? Like Alejandra uh, gave me the opportunity to, to see the photo when he uh, got his Sweet Fifteens in Mexico. You know? Doña Honorina also, this photo is in Mexico. 
And also I am working in another project about Sweet Fifteens. I work with one of my friends who is a choreographer of quinceañeras. And uh, basically I work in this project on Saturdays when I have two free Saturdays. And I focus this project more like speaking about the compadrazgo, that is like the way that the festivity uh, makes uh, itself. And I spend the whole day with these girls and I interview them. And yeah, this I think this one is like it's an ongoing project. And yeah, there's like different kind of um, ways to document also. I noticed that uh, mostly in these festivities, uh, some of the families of the relatives uh, in the party um, do a, a stream live no? to the family that I can own come to the party to the US. And most of them are from Puebla, but others are from Guerrero or from uh, Tlaxcala, Hidalgo. And this is another party that I uh, have. This is one of my comadres and my goddaughters. And, um, I am working with four different indigenous women. One of them speaks Clapaneco, the other I speak Mixteco, uh, the other Tenec, and the other uh, Nahuatl. And I basically, when I, they invite me to their homes, I uh, bring my camera and take photos. <coughs> and it's, I am like a still ongoing project, no? I'm not going to finish. But I, I am adding to this project like interviews in their own language so the people can understand more, like they are not like common immigrants, Mexican immigrants, they are indigenous, no? And they come from, from these two mountains that are like taken by the drug traffic, like Guerrero, they used to grow up in uh, poppies, uh, the Tlapaneca and Mixteca in Guerrero back in Mexico. And yeah, I am like working with them in this project. And also, I have a friend who is a healer, and sometimes when I see him, I uh, bring my camera, and he's Totonaco, he speaks Totonaco from uh, Puebla. His, his uh, village is between Puebla and Veracruz, and he has his own live boutique in New Jersey, and for the past 20 years he has been here in, in New Jersey, like working as a healer, basically, you know, doing consultas, and uh, we, he, he's like trying to be in the project, you know, in the participatory manner. He sometimes uh, tells me like, we should do this kind of things, we should say something you know, about the project. And I also record his voice in Totonaco, but he did the El Guion. He writes the things that he wants to say in the, in the, in the multimedia. And, and also, cause it's like I live in a church, and for me, it's like super easily to be in contact with the community because I only need to cross the door of my mm -hmm. home to be in the church. And usually, we have parties uh, at least once a month, and that's made me have the opportunity to go and take photos to how the Mexicans celebrate their own festivities. And uh, this is one of my friends who is from Guerrero, and he's a musician, and he. Uh, I was working with him, taking photos for his album, and yeah, this is one of the festivities in the church where I live. Is that they are dancing La Danza de las Canastas, it's like traditional dance from Puebla, and, and yeah, it's basically the work that I do. I think that I need to grow up as a photographer right now, and yeah, I think like little by little, and I just get graduated like the patch of life. Human Development in the College Community of Public Affairs. Binghamton University, the University of New York, conducts ethnographic research that lies at the intersection of forced migration, humanitarianism, and development. He earned his BA in Sociology at Vassar College 
his MA and PhD in sociology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He went on to hold the first Chancellor's Postdoctoral Fellowship at the University of California, Los Angeles in the Department of Anthropology and was a visiting fellow at the Refugee Studies Center, <coughs> University of Oxford. P. Garcia has over 10 years of expertise and experience in conducting research with disadvantaged indigenous Mayan migrants from Guatemala. His work examines barriers to their incorporation in La Gloria, a former refugee settlement located in Mexico's southernmost border state of Chiapas and the U.S. and in the U.S. P. Garcia's scholarship is linked by three interrelated strands of research. First, his work integrates the theories of race and gender to understand how the conditional cash transfer program, Prospera, a state-run development program framed as promoting gender equality, impacts gender power relations, reproductive health, and poverty among recipient families in La Gloria. A second strand explores how weak development policies by the Mexican state undermine post-reconstruction efforts by indigenous Guatemalan refugees to, the, to propel ongoing international migra migration in the US, to the US. A third strand explores how race, class, and gender shape barriers to the incorporation of La Gloria migrant kin in the US that include legalization and labor exploitation in the garment industry in Los Angeles, California. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. As you can tell, I'm not a photographer. I'm an academic. Um, but I collaborate with a photographer, uh, who I will introduce uh, as I proceed my presentation. Um, I wish to start my talk by thanking the organizers of this event and Baxter Photography Club of New York. I am the eldest son of Mexican immigrants, born and raised in New York City. And as was mentioned, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Community and Public Affairs, in the, pardon me, in the Department of Human Development uh, at Binghamton University. For some reason, what I wrote here is not appearing as I was hoping. Oh, there it is. Okay, very good. All right. So I'm going to break the norm here and read from the text that I wrote for this presentation. So since 2004, I have conducted ethnographic field work uh, with indigenous Maya from Guatemala and La, La Gloria, a former refugee settlement located in the state of Chiapas, Mexico, along with their migrant kin in the U.S. My brother, uh, Manuel Gil, a graduate of San Francisco, San Francisco Art Institute, also known as SFAI, has documented the individuals I have interviewed in both settings, and my brother is seated here, uh, joining us as well. Uh, some of our earlier work has been exhibited throughout Southern California, such as the 18th Street Arts Center and the Refugee Studies Center at the University of Oxford. Now, our growing up in an immigrant household and direct experience with immigration enforcement inspires our work. In 2007, I met two subjects, Andrea and Miguel, in Chiapas, Mexico. Both fled from Guatemala as children, along with their families, and settled in Mexico. But due to ongoing inequalities and the unwillingness of the Mexican state to provide access to legal status that barred access to employment, both emigrated to the United States to find work. The following passages will briefly describe a snapshot of our collaborative socio-documentary work. To maintain anonymity, pseudonyms are used throughout. In 2006, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, otherwise known as ICE, conducted an immigration raid at their workplace, which resulted in the arrest of hundreds of immigrant workers. During their incarceration, their four-year-old and eight-year-old son a U.S. citizen national and Mexican-born national, respectively, remained in the care of another family member. While the father managed to be released on bail, his wife remained incarcerated for several months and was eventually deported. Her husband, unable to make ends meet and care for their two children without <coughs> their mother, became an unintended returnee. Now, for geographers, Price and Reese, <coughs> unintended returnees reflect a type of involuntary mobility that is a direct result 
of state-driven draconian immigration policies. This concept, however, stops short of explaining the experiences of their U.S.-born son, David. According to psychologist Luis H. Sayas, U.S. immigration enforcement policies create circumstances where, whereby U.S. citizen children can become either orphans or exiles following the incarceration and deportation of undocumented and documented parents. Unlike his parents or brother, David remains in exile in Mexico. Our brief meeting at the conclusion of my dissertation research in Chiapas, Mexico, haunted me for years to come. My research has been driven by a desire to give back to the people we study. The indigenous Maya has survived systematic genocide, a result of a 30-year-long war funded by the United States. And now, as a consequence of draconian immigration policies, La Gloria Migrant Kin in the United States faced family separations through deportations. It was clear that more work was needed to be done to address ongoing systematic inequities that affect members of this community across nation-state borders. Consequently, in 2012, I approached Miguel again, now an elected community leader of La Gloria, and shared with him my own personal experience, observing an immigration raid in my home and deportation of several of my caregivers. I informed him how seeing his son David brought back these difficult memories. Had my father or mother been deported in lieu of my uncles, I too could have been David. As a result of this disclosure, which helped reinforce his trust, he soon confided in me that his wife, along with 38 other indigenous Mayans, remained stateless in three communities, in La Gloria, San Francisco, and Nueva Libertad, also known as El Colorado, in Chiapas, Mexico. Now, for over 30 years, these 39 individuals remained stateless in contravention to international humanitarian protocols. In both Mexico and the United States, the following photographs taken by my brother Manuel in 2016 feature some of these individuals who also agreed to have their family members featured in another image. Our aim with these photographs, along with their ethnographic descriptions, is to help illustrate their strength, strategies for survival, and barriers to social, political, and economic incorporation they and their families face as a consequence of their legal, or pardon me, lack of legal status in Mexico and the United States. Now due to time constraints, I will only discuss a, a, a very few number of these photographs. One participant, seen here, Mercedes, is 86 years old. I met Mercedes several weeks after she suffered from a debilitating heart attack that left her paralyzed and unable to speak. She is the mother of 10. Most of her children now, full grown adults, reside in Mexico. Two sons live in the United States and periodically send remittances for her care, while another daughter lives in Guatemala. She has over 40 grandchildren and 10 great grandchildren. Unlike her progeny, she has lived without legal status for over a third of her life, a consequence of not having naturalization. She has been unable to obtain health insurance in Mexico and utilizes the small amount of remittances sent by her sons in the U.S. to purchase the vitamins and medication she needs to maintain her blood pressure and reduce the risk of another heart attack. The vulnerability Mercedes has experienced as a stateless subject in Mexico mirrors the experiences of millions who remain without legal status throughout the United States and others throughout Mexico. Now our ability to gain the rapport and trust of these individuals and families necessary for Manuel to take these photographs was a direct result of my three year long collaboration with a Mexican attorney, Julia Guadalupe Torres Ventura, and the leader of this community, Miguel. In 2014, we put forth a formal grievance to request the naturalization of all who remain stateless. Throughout this period, the state attempted to undermine our efforts by promote, promising to provide legal status only if family members who previously obtained naturalization, supported politicians running for re-election in, in, in the local and state area. Consequently, of the original 39 people we were working with, only 26 stateless subjects continued to participate in the collective grievance. In 2015, the Instituto Nacional de la Mujer, also known as INMUJER, Mexico's National Institute of Women, organized a national competition titled Concurso Mujer Migrante, 
and invited women throughout the country to submit their migration experiences. Another collaborator, videographer, Luz de Alba Velasco, helped video record the difficult traumatic ordeal Andrea experienced as a result of the U.S. immigration raid, incarceration, and deportation, and submitted the recording for, her for consideration for this competition. Andrea was selected among the top finalists, and upon receiving her award in Mexico City, disclosed to the audience how her ordeal has been compounded by the lack of legal status that bars her from accessing certain social services and makes her vulnerable to deportation in Mexico. She also disclosed how many others who fled Guatemala's violent civil war in the 1980s remain stateless. This announcement in a government forum created additional public pressure toward the Mexican state to address our <coughs> ongoing grievance. In brief, thanks to our multi-pronged strategy to pressure the Mexican state, we successfully obtained naturalized citizenship for 26 formerly stateless subjects just this year. In the months to come, I will write up findings from interviews conducted from these interviews that I conducted and examine the constraints they experience as stateless residents and the opportunities they foresee now that they have obtained naturalized citizenship. We also plan on finding venues to exhibit Manuel's photographs to provide a larger public uh, to become familiar with the ongoing struggle faced by indigenous Maya and other Central American migrants who face increased racial profiling and discrimination as a consequence of ramped up immigration enforcement throughout Mexico. Thank you. Alejandro Yoshi is a multidisciplinary artist working with sculpture, drawing, installation, and performance. His work has been exhibited throughout Mexico and the United States. In 2011, his work was selected for two biennials in Mexico, the fifth National Biennial of Visual Arts, Yucatan, and the 13th Northwest Biennial of Visual Arts. After moving to New York in 2012, Yoshi's work was exhibited at the Governor's Island Art Fair 2013 and 14. The Kitchen, the National Opera Center, and Emoa Space Gallery. He has been an artist in residence at the Vermont Studio Center, participated at the Chasamant Studio Program, and NYFA's Immigrant Artist Mentoring Program. He received his MFA from Parsons, the New School for Design in 2014. Hi. Um... My name is Alejandro, and <clears throat> I'm from Mazatlán, Mexico, Mexico. Uh, and whenever I say that I'm from Mexico, people stop for a second and wonder if I'm from somewhere else, or like they say, me, they tell me that my Spanish is perfect, or that yeah, some indigenous people in, looks a little bit Asian, and but indeed I'm from Asian heritage. My these are Japanese immigrant Mexico. And the one on the right is my grandfather. Uh, he came to Mexico in 1930. Um, there was a lot of immigration to, like, to the U.S., but also to Latin America, no? like Peru, Brazil, and Mexico. Um, then my grandmother came later. They weren't married at that time. There was like this kind of uh, long-distance marriage, like because there were, there were a lot of uh, man, male immigrants to. They were mostly men, no? And so they wanted to match, like, Japanese women to them because they weren't any. <laughs> uh, so it was kind of, I mean, it was weird because they never met in person. And they, she traveled to, to Mexico, only see him through photographs, no? So it was kind of a very ancient Tinder version, I guess. <laughs> um, and my mom, you know, my mom, my, my grandmother was a poet. And she used to write haikus and tankas. Um, I'm presenting here like the Spanish, Japanese, and English version. I'm gonna read them in Spanish. Del otro lado de los mares lejanos veo los caminos en los cuales he de andar para alcanzar mi visión. And that photograph is when she traveled from Japan to Mexico, and it was like a 30 days uh, trip in the boat. And so. That happened. <laughs> <laughs> Ojos que gritan, pinches inmigrantes, no vean, mejor díganlo. Al fin, nuestro espíritu es pureza y nobleza. She, in her memory, she expressed a lot of like welcoming from Mexicans, but also, I guess, during the Second World War, uh, there was this uh, 
the US hegemony and, and the Mexican state uh, and the alliance, uh, they forced the Japanese immigrants to relocate in Mexico City or Guadalajara. So they kind of experienced like a double diaspora, like coming from their country, but then also in Mexico, being relocated from San Luis Potosí to Mexico City. Um, and then, but yeah. Uh, mis favoritas son esas quesadillas de la coche. <laughs> son de ellas que me hacen más y más mexicana. <laughs> and then she wrote me a poem de una langosta dibujo de mi nieto. El que es costeño, casi salta del plato y se sale del dibujo. And, yeah, so, in unrelated things, I'm going to talk about my work now. And, um, this is a painting installation that I did and I used a uh, squid ink as a medium and my index finger as a tool to mark making and so I was given this space to show and I just uh, put many fingerprints around the space. Uh, I think when I was making this work I was thinking of like identity as a fluid concept and like uh, that relates to the body and also location too. I guess that's what I did. And for this other project, uh, this is a participatory work that I did, and I invited uh, many gay men from dating apps and mm -hmm. to collaborate and make a work. And so I interviewed them and I asked them like only one question, but then later more other questions arising from that. But it was like how they perceive themselves. Um, because in social media, I guess we're all exposed, like, like our body and our like identity. But it's like, like it's just like a very curated identity, you know. And I just wanted to go and talk more about them. And so it was like the process. And then, like I recorded the interview and I transcribed it, made a website, and each object has a number, and so you could go and read what is the person behind that object, no? And in the installation I also have a video installation that it was like I made like one to two minute clips and just with actions, performative actions or landscapes or like different things and I put the, some text, some part of the text as a subtitle like if it was just like a thought or something um, with, the pers with the people's uh, constant um, <coughs> words. Uh, then I also do performance sometimes and I did this performance where I grounded cacao and made a paste that I used to make drawings with it and then like with, uh, with the drawings were like uh, 43 gestures, drawing gestures but also movement in the space and like it was a time-based thing and and it was during the, the 43 missing students time like last year and so it was kind of a silent protest but also like thinking about the concept of no thinking about the construction of a concept like through symbol repetition and mobility in a way like how a concept is constructed and and I was interested in also I mean obviously because of what happened but but also like how this number became so like a symbol for a social mobilization, no? And so that was it. And that's all that I have. Magallanes Martinez is a visual artist exploring identity, intimacy, and power through a variety of mediums, including photography and video. Through performance and improvisation, Jessica explores tensions found within constructed social relationships. Her work examines and recontextualizes familial and cultural boundaries. Jessica is currently a graduate student in photography at Columbia University. She received her BFA in transmedia from Syracuse University. Hi everyone. Um, so the project that I'm going to show today is called And I You. I use photography as a point of departure for instances of <coughs> mutual trust and vulnerability and as a way to document intimacy. 
I think of intimacy as a necessary layer of protection, of being open to everything as a way to remain close to propriety. My subjects allow me to use their bodies and our relationships to make portraits of them, myself, and as surrogates for one another. We line performance for an otherwise hidden authenticity and a collaborative approach to photography. Gestures reflect private histories that are encoded within the images. I believe beauty exists in those brief moments when we see ourselves, and the idea that those moments are non-tangible gifts from one to another. Throughout my work, moments of tender intimacy are complicated and interrupted by moments of cold appraisal. <coughs> this mimics the way I interpret and understand the world, people, my relationships and self. The most intimate and tender images always come in the quietest moments. Those images are models of seduction, specifically the moment in seduction when you give in, a surrender. Much of my imagery is about desire, the desire to be seen, invisible, wanted and performed for. <coughs> I met Grant in the spring of 2007, the second spring I had ever experienced. Moving from South Central Los Angeles to Syracuse, New York was a radical shift, with the weather being only the most visible difference between the two places. Spring in Syracuse feels like waking after a long night of relentless bad dreams. Everything is wet and alive. Grant and I became collaborators very quickly, partially because everything about him felt so open. I was most drawn to Grant's lack of reservation about his body. This was both beautiful and foreign to me. Having been raised Catholic, female, and Mexican, I had a different relationship with my body, one that made his especially dear. Grant's body became many things, and I use it almost alchemically, attempting to convert one element into another, turning raw flesh into something that doesn't exist yet. We've explored this photographically for many years now, the images evolving in their pursuit alongside Grant's body, gender identity, and our relationship. During the winter before I met Grant, I began making images with my family back in Los Angeles. I came to this after many years of photographing our neighborhood in South Central, attempting to represent and understand the dual forces of violence and religious faith that made our community. This investigation led inward more and more until my sister's mother and godmother began closing for me. Initially, we attempted traditional portraits, the kind I was learning about in school. I learned first and foremost to recognize and honor the emotional core of my subjects. This lesson remains in the forefront of my practice, even when shifting in and out of more performative and hyper-constructed modes. Tradition as it appears in my work is a palpable and pliable material, something I can honor, fetishize, examine, fondle, and reshape. My subjects and I create moments of introspection while working to reclaim images of the body and question the accomplishment of gender. The photographs reveal the strength, beauty, and sometimes tragedy I believe family to possess and exist as testaments of desire and love. Through the use of allegory and symbolism, the conjoined images of my created family and my biological family recontextualize and inform one another while stripping away the fog of cultural projection of desired ideas, <coughs> creating a space photographically that doesn't exist for me in any other way. In this context, photography is a privilege, and it has allowed me to create a hypothetical universe where I can inspect and dismantle the cultural hegemony and social constructs that shape interior and corporate. the intersection of site reflexivity, architectural discourse, and urban policy. His work engages constructive space as a perceptual and political medium. 
Yeah, that's great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, this, I feel like we've been part of an endurance piece today. This is really amazing, and thank you all for having me in Baxter Street as well. Um, so I'm going to read a short paper, um, and I'm not going to speak about my work directly, but a kind of larger uh, picture of it, the age. And while I was born in Mexico City to a Mexican father and American mother, I was raised in New York visiting Mexico and my extended family throughout my life. This cultural miscegenation straddling a space somewhere between New York and Mexico has brought about a kind of internal duality or splitting that has at times been a complex position to navigate. What does it mean to be of Mexican descent and not necessarily identify culturally as Mexican-American? I am reminded of Stuart Hall, who similarly questioning his own subject position as a person of color in different contexts, said, quote, I'm not one or another of these ways of representing me, though I've been all of them at different times and still am some of them to some degree. But there's no essential I, only the fragmentary contradictory subject I become, end quote. Surely this experience has also been conditioned by my physical appearance and the way I quote unquote present as white. Yet while the notion of passing brings about questions of privilege and access, it might also be akin to a form of espionage. For instance, I can recall countless examples of being in the presence of others who are unaware of my background and made racist comments about Latinos and Latinos. In these moments, one gains deep insight into the way hegemony is embodied on a profoundly deep level. On a more collective level, surely we've all encountered this kind of racist ideology targeting essentialized bad hombres to cite just one recent example. But surely you don't have the time to pack these questions here, but this kind of duality or a dialectic position of being simultaneously both outside and inside is also an architectural condition that drives much of my work and has informed the way I think about spatial politics. So for instance, I'm drawn to systems of enclosure and partitioning that have become emblematic of the globalized built environment as a means of asking how these seemingly benign structural conditions actually reflect and reproduce social hierarchies. How do systems of standardization and mass customization produce not only objects, but subjects as well? These questions resolve themselves through what I've termed radical formalism. A radical formalism might offer ways of considering the material conditions of our present moment, or as a means of illuminating work's institutional frame. By welcoming contextual readings of form, we enable ourselves to understand what form can perform. Engaging with the question of form and politics, for the past several years I've been developing what I've considered to be a typology of screens, which you see here. At its most basic level, a screen is a form that negotiates the absolute and literal distinction between interior and exterior space. The screen is also a symbolic form that negotiates the highly charged boundaries of inclusion and exclusion, a form that influences social relations in the most fundamental sense. The screen triangulates these relations by existing between them. Its disposition then is one of distinction, whereby what it excludes defines it as much as what it includes. In this sense, systems of enclosure and partitioning not only play significant roles in the development and regulation of the globalized built environment, but also in the construction of subjectivity. Mexico City's infrastructure presents a dynamic example of the way screens are used to create disproportionate enclosures that articulate social hierarchies. So for instance, a reja, a common partition found at the entrance of affluent homes and communities, is a structural example of the privilege that privacy affords. Yet we might also consider the reja, as you see here, or screen as part of a larger infrastructural condition introduced by neoliberal policies such as NAFTA that have influenced the shape and contour of the global city. Surely rampant conditions of financialization and privatization are not unique to Mexico City, but perhaps an even more extreme and repeatable spatial condition in New York, where hyperdevelopment and luxury urbanism has become a kind of Western standard. Here's Santa Fe. Uh, within today's pandemic of gentrification, the urban economy undergoes a kind of standardized resuscitation in which developers perform urban facelifts and provide uh, spatial formulas with successful track records, all to the effect that places become non-places, and more troubling, these non-places become places. We might even question how art and culture help lubricate this condition. While these notions point to the way space is produced as both material and ideology, they also raise pressing questions about who benefits from these policies and who is further subjugated to the position of other, or better yet, kept on the other side of the screen. This brings us back to the question of identity and place. Marxist geographer David Harvey suggests we now live in a world of diminishing spatial barriers to exchange, movement, and circulation, making place-bound identity more rather than less important. However, we should also consider how this same homogenizing condition has brought about other kinds of spatial barriers. <laughs> standardized screens that regulate the inclusion of some values over others, some traditions over others, and some bodies over others. Perhaps these screens are not always visible, but embodied through norms of practice. <coughs> Maintaining the specificity of cultural ethnicity, 
but also expanding its limits might allow us to resist the normalizing project of globalization and shake the habitual development of Western standards. Thanks. Zacatecas, Mexico, in 1973 and raised in Chicago. He received his BA in studio art at the City College of New York. Of New York. Garcia is a photo-based artist and craftsman. As an artist, he's constantly looking for ways to counteract the flatness that's inherent to photography. Creating, holding, cutting, interlacing prints, or collaging are all different attempts at realizing that goal. Photography allows him to explore aspects of his identity and decode the world he lives in. Queer, Mexican, American, immigrant, secular, Catholic. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> um, good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to talk about two different uh, projects that I'm, I'm working on. Uh, it's, one of them is called Defining You. And so what I like to do with, I work, use photography as just one part of, the, of my work. So I like to weave, cut up, slice, collage uh, imagery and to create basically one final image. <clears throat> so this project called Defining You started uh, during my therapy sessions or when I started therapy and the idea that basically your childhood memories are always, it's like a constant conversation that you have with your therapist is childhood memories. Uh, and so that got me into thinking about uh, all these childhood memories basically make up who you are as an adult. Uh, so what I started doing here was taking portraits of people and uh, weaving childhood pictures, creating a collage and hand weaving uh, their <coughs> pictures. Sort of like to see, you know, like you'll only see certain aspects of <coughs> images. Um, so, the other one was one of the beginning ones where I was just weaving like onto the image, I mean around the image. And then I started liking the idea of uh, images, like memories, like infiltrating even like into your own uh, person. So that's uh, one of the later pieces. Uh, <clears throat> also what I started thinking about when I was working on this project is it just so happened that a lot of the people that I por uh, took portraits of were also bicultural like I was you know either they were first generation uh, Mexican or Colombian or somebody like me who uh, was born in Mexico but came here at a really young age so <clears throat> I started thinking about that idea too of like where you're weaving two cultures together where it's like your Mexican identity and the American uh, culture, which you can't help but to absorb since this is where you live. Uh, <coughs> but the other thing too is I have about eight, I think maybe 10 images or pieces like this, and none of the weaving uh, is the same. So they're all different. So I also like to think of that as like DNA structure and how nobody's, how everybody has uh, a unique idea, uh, DNA structure. So, yeah, so that's defining you. Um, and so, now I want to talk about Queer Icons. Uh, Queer Icons is a portrait series that I work, have been working on for the past four years. And this is a portrait series that highlights the queer trans community of color. Um, so this project started about four or five years ago when uh, marriage equality was a really big hot topic in, in New York or in the US. And <clears throat> there's, there was a lot of representation of like a queer identity, uh, a lot of queer uh, presence started making it into the mainstream. But one thing that I noticed is that it was very one-sided. It wasn't, it was very white. And what I wanted to do was incorporate my community into the conversation, <clears throat> sort of like highlighting uh, individuals uh, of color. Because also, I was, you know, when I was going to art school, I had to go to all these galleries, museums, and I was never seeing 
my community represented in any of these <coughs> So <clears throat> that's when I started working on queer icons. Now, the other thing too is, you know, I grew up Catholic and I like to say that I go into church every Sunday, walking into these cathedrals. Rel religious art was my introduction to art. Uh, and so even as a kid, I've always like been fascinated by the ornate gold frames that um, <clears throat> that all of this imagery is, is encased in, and all the gold, silver, all the metallic uh, imagery. So the, these are some of the portraits. So this is not straight photography. I do printmaking. This is a photogravure, and all of the color you see is actually hand cut paper that's been collaged onto the image. The chincole? Yeah, the chincole. Uh, and then the like the halo part, the rays are silkscreen, which is the last part of the series, or the last part of the, <clears throat> the imagery. Uh, and later on, what I, like I said before, I like to start a project and I like to push it even further as I go along. So. When I first started this project, I was working mostly with my friends, uh, taking their portraits. Then it started getting really big, and I wanted to hone in on just a specific uh, group from the queer trans community. And so then I started taking pictures or focusing on either poets or community organizers or activists who were making uh, our community visible, right? So. The other thing that I thought about is when you take a portrait, you, in a way, you silence that person's uh, voice because it's you're taking their picture and it's the viewer who narrates what they're seeing. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to give them their their voice back. So it became sort of a collaboration where I would take their portrait, give them their image, and then I would have them uh, write whatever text that they would want to write about themselves or their identity or basically whatever message it is that they want to put out into the world. And so that's what, that's the writing that you see here uh, where this is his handwriting and then that's his handwriting. They've been together for like 15 years so even their handwriting matches I guess. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so that's a uh, uh, Carlos and Fernando, that's the name of this piece. And uh, they've been married for about 10 years. And for me, uh, like queer love and the idea that uh, two people can be together for so long is a revolutionary act in itself. Uh, it's a form of activism, I see it. And so that's the reason why I decided to take their portrait. They also happen to have gotten married right in that small little window uh, in California when before Proposition 8. So, if, you know, the, the state had to recognize their marriage. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so, also what I, what I wanted to do is I wanted them to be uh, portraits that obviously like stared at the, at the viewer sort of defiantly uh, sort of saying like I'm not gonna hide for for your comfort. This is who I am, and this is whether it's like uh, you don't like the way I look, you don't like my body or my lifestyle, then you know basically like fuck you. Uh, <clears throat> and also, <coughs> yeah. So that's what what all of the the writing uh, has to do with this with this project. Um, and here, this is one of the most recent ones that I did. Uh, the, also, the other thing that I wanted to talk or mention is the, is obviously they're all like uh, set up as saints, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what I, I thought about. I thought about uh, community organizers, activists. They're going above and beyond their, uh, their human, uh, they're basically sacrificing their lives or their, themselves for the betterment of their community, similar to what saints did and, and what they still do. So that's, uh, <clears throat> that's what Queer, Icon, Queer Icons is. Um, also, before, it's almost time, but I have 
12 of these prints up in uh, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. So that's like a, to see a church accept my work and uh, and make it part of their uh, their project. So it's up until March 2017. So if you guys want to take a trip up, you're welcome. And also, it, I make all of the hand, the frames are also all. I didn't take any pictures or include here, but they're all like uh, handmade uh, frames that I've also made to specific to each print. Um, that's it. of geography and architecture. Her photographs and texts comment on how these affect and modify human relationships. Human relations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so hi, I'm Livia. Um, I'm going to try to make this very fast. I'm showing you guys a video that um, <coughs> covers uh, buildings uh, that expand between the 1870s and the present. Um, I am a photographer of all sorts, uh, but I have a very uh, uh, direct uh, interest in architecture, but not in the aesthetics of architecture, but more how it affects the way of life and also how it's used as a political performance because the projects that I photograph uh, follow um, governmental initiatives in Mexico on a federal level and in a way that uh, characteristically uh, affects entire communities but sadly doesn't get modified it is left to annihilate itself and for this reason my projects tend to take between 10 and 15 years because I like to see the beginning, the selling of the idea, the peak of the idea, the dwindling down of the idea and then the, the cancellation. In the, the video that I, that I will be showing um, is about it's, it's part of a video, it's part of a, a longer video uh, that is part of a show. I have a show right now at my gallery in Mexico City in Colonia Roma. It's up until January if any one of you go, uh, end up going. But in, in any case, um, the, the way that I, that I work presents the some sculptural stuff, some photographs, and video. And in this video, we're going to see um, the conical uh, shaped grain silos of built by Conasupo, the, commission, the National Commission of um, Popular Supplements, which was a governmental initiative that started in, in the mid-60s to provide a place for independent farmers uh, to sell their, their farming uh, product and be guaranteed a price nationwide and thereby accumulate all of the grain and be able to sell it in the world market for a higher price with the promise that the benefits of that sale would trickle down to the farmers. However, Conasupo was, was run by two of the most notoriously corrupt uh, uh, po political allies. The first one was... Por favor! No yelling. It's your mother. <laughs> Uh, the first one was uh, uh, Carlos Hank, who was in charge of Conasupo, and the second was Raúl Salinas de Gortari. And, and for those of you who follow Mexican politics, that's, uh, it's, it, it, it allows an ending of describing uh, the mishandling. And uh, Conasupo uh, built the grain silos all over, uh, but in, in places where ejidatarios uh, uh, were in cahoots with the alcalde, with the mayor, and not necessarily in the places that were accessible to farmers. The program builds uh, approximately 4,200 of these conical silos based on one architectural plan that took the idea from colonialist era uh, grain storage system. One of them, uh, uh, the most uh, known one is in Zacatecas and it belonged to a family, a feudal family, um, 
that had so much land that you'll see in some of the images, there's, there's 32 of them, but in the program they gave entire communities a single one. It gives you an idea of the scale, but also the symbolism of the government saying, here you too can have uh, your, bit, your bit of the castle. And um, the, the program uh, was cancelled because of um, uh, many failings, but in part it was also cancelled to pave the way for the National Free Trade Agreement, which was signed two years after the program failed. Once NAFTA came into Mexico, um, agro-industries uh, came with such force that independent farming in Mexico basically was uh, destroyed and there you have the wave of migration. My interest in the project worked backwards where I was living in um, I was living in, in uptown well not so I was living in Morningside Heights and it, and it became uh, very noticeable to me between 2000 and 2010 the increase of uh, migrant workers of a certain demographic usually men usually from farming towns and I wanted to find out how it worked and, and that's how I ended up with Conasupo. Here we go. It's in Spanish. Um, it, it starts with a TV commercial and then the narration by a man from Zacatecas who tells the story of the men who leave. And then it wraps with a voiceover from a TV commercial. Did I press play? A uh, bit. The, the five year old. Press it here. Is it loud enough? But we'll see if I don't. <coughs> the name of the program was Graneros del Pueblo. La inversión que requiere el campo para producir los alimentos que todos consumimos es considerable. Cuando el campesino no tiene recursos suficientes para invertir, ¿qué pasa? Entre otras instituciones, Corazupo hace un esfuerzo para que no se detenga la producción, proporcionando al campesino diversos apoyos y múltiples servicios. El campesino responde. años eh, y yo les traía lo que y andaba trabajando con mi papá, mis hermanos mayores que yo, este, les traía el, en la mañana el desayuno y la tarde la comida, por eso yo recuerdo cuando se hicieron estas, estas bodegas, estos bodegas, sí, sí nos benefició sí nos benefició mucho en, en el aspecto de que antes el precio no era seguro. Venía un comprador y nos compraba a un precio, venía otro y a otro precio. Entonces, cuando se, se, se abrieron aquí las corazupos, este, se estabilizó el precio, era el precio de garantía. Y subiera o bajara, el gobierno nos pagaba a ese precio, siempre lo respetó. Y nosotros fuimos de acuerdo y nos convenía porque era un precio justo para todos. Así es. Aquí se dijo que ya no se completaba de dinero y que esto y que el otro, pero fue un salidero para desaparecer con el grupo. Más bien la desapareció el gobierno. Nuevos gobernantes, claro, ya los, los anteriores, pues sí, trabajaron bien, pero hubo nuevos y, y ya, no, ya no les gustó con el como no les debería ganarse, ya lo que querían o no sé, pero así fue desapareciendo con el
no, muchos no tienen para, para sembrar ese apoyo que, 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 que necesitamos en el campo, de que nos abran las puertas tantito, de, 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 de poder seguir haciéndole lucha a trabajar y a trabajar, entretenernos en algo. Mucha gente se desespera y le corre al otro lado. Y arriesgar su vida, pues es muy peligroso. Y aún así, así se va la gente por otro lado. ¿Cómo ven? Muchos sí regresan y muchos no, porque allá se quedan, no se quedan en el camino. director of the Celebrate Mexico Now Festival. She is back there. Um, and maybe you can talk really briefly about the festival. And, um, sure. Um, well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to the Camera Club for inviting us once again to partner with them on this amazing, amazing presentation. Uh, I think um, we are all Mexican and we are trying to do with their own uh, way to try to uh, portray who we are and what what we do in New York. In this case, that's kind of like the idea of the Celebrate Mexico Now Festival. Uh, it's a multidisciplinary festival. We've been doing this for the last 13 years. We are an independent entity, so uh, collaboration, partnerships is the key for us to keep going. And so I want to just let you know that it has been like amazing uh, the curatorial uh, for this exhibition, congratulations, and thank you for putting 
all of us together uh, today here. I think it has been really, really important to, uh, for all of us to hear your stories and, 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 and also important to share our stories. So um, today is the last day of the festival. So um, I have a program here. We, uh, we actually, we are heading to the party, the closing <laughs> night party right now. And I, I hope you can all can come. Um, so the party is going to take place at Cold Place Terraza Siete in Jackson Heights. Uh, that for the last 15 years was like the oasis and uh, paradise for uh, independent musicians, not only for Mexican musicians, but in general for the music uh, scene. And gentrification has uh, reached Jackson Heights, and this place is going to close. So, as a tribute to a place that gathers communities and offers uh, artists a space to share and to perform, uh, we decided to to have as a tribute to the place uh, Mexico now as a place that likes to you know, support places uh, that are welcoming to artists and, and Mexican community. Uh, so we're going there. We are heading now to Jackson Heights, <laughs> and it will be fantastic if you can join us. Um, uh, I think, uh, I'm pretty sure you know most of the people who perform. These are the local bands that they've been uh, doing some carocho and some uh, DJing in different places and um, and it would be fantastic to have you as part of the community all together with the music 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 community that is coming together as well so it would be like a great party uh, I just once again want to want to thank uh, Lily for for calling us and and, and having us as a part again of your programming. Thank you. And I think I want to thank also Carla and Irma. Uh, we've been planning the participation of Carla and uh, Irma for a long time. And I would love to see if we can all recreate this uh, next year at the festival. I think it's very important. I think it's. Uh, they made the matchmaking for us to, 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 to get together and, and you can probably expand or create something. I, I think it's really, really, uh, it was, for me it was very um, an amazing experience this afternoon. <laughs> so and thank you for sharing your story. So thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Yes. Just one thing for the people who spoke today. If I could just get a photograph of all of you up here, that would be really nice for me. Yeah. For the video that we'll put up. Okay. And go ahead, Emma. You wanted to oh. say something? But yeah, I just wanted to mention that uh, I have an exhibit uh, solo exhibit at the Mexican Consulate. Uh, right now, the opening was in Fire, which is part of Mexico now, and the uh, Institute. And so the exhibit uh, is a uh, part of what I showed today. And I have uh, 35 silver gelatin prints in the exhibit. And it would be great if you can go and see it. It's going to be the, uh, I think, at the mid February. So you have a chance to go. OK. Thank you. Anyone wants to announce anything? <laughs> <laughs> There's your chance. <laughs>